Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and a new week on the channel. And this week, it's all about artillery, including a self propelled gun or two and including chemical mortars, which are the artillery. Well, rather like our tank destroyer week, we'll discuss what is and isn't artillery as the week goes on. But starting us off today, it's about time David's been on the channel. He's been following us since right the early days. I think he said his first show was the big 11 hour, 15 hour, whatever it was, D-Day marathon three years ago. But David Patterson, who comes with more qualification for this you can throw a stick at is here to talk about canadian artillery on juno beach and beyond so uh good afternoon david it's holiday over there how are you doing today very well good to be here thanks for the invite i'm happy to uh happy to finally as i said what, to break my duck i think is the word over here break your duck yeah yeah <laughs> all right and so you know good. artillery it's it's a part of every show we do in it if we're covering the ground war artillery comes up artillery particularly when we get to normandy but also north africa Tun tunisia it's it's one of montgomery's favorite arms if that's not an odd expression but expression but yet we haven't really tackled it as a, as a separate subject so we're, we're we're getting it off the ground today and um you've been doing it man and boy for a long long time artillery and and you know, as someone who's seen it all the way through it's it's basically the same now in terms of what it was all those decades ago. It's, is it really the communications that have improved? Yeah, it's certainly the, the speed of communication, the, uh, the range of guns, you know, the technology has gotten better in, in, in every, every way almost. Um, but uh, the, you know, the things like, uh, and the things they're doing in Ukraine with artillery just blow your socks off in terms of the technology they're using to basically bypass the command post and talk directly to the guns from the observer uh, and so yeah the, the, the technology has advanced in, in an amazing way and the precision and range of guns but the techniques and the, the, the basic skills uh, I always I say it's just it's just applied math right it's really uh, yeah you're just basically applying uh, uh, trigonometry to uh, to the to the art of, uh, of warfare Brilliant. Well, you've come on with a PowerPoint, which you'll take us through. Uh, David's in control of this, folks. Um, viewers, I don't know that you'll have many questions because I think David is going to cover everything. But if you do have them, fire away. And we'll, pun, pun intended there, fire away. We'll put them up on screen. But essentially, I'm going to hand over to David now to take us through the role of Canadian artillery in Normandy. So over to you, David. Thanks. Thanks very much, Woody. And once again, a, a pleasure and an honor to be here to start off Artillery Week. Uh, so what I'm basically going to be talking about today is, you know, the, the, a little bit of the background because I'm uh, going to talk about where, how do we get to Normandy in the Canadian artillery? Um, uh, how do we organize ourselves to do the, the job of supporting the maneuver arms? And then specifically about what happens on, on D-Day because it's sort of a unique uh, event, uh, mm. separate from what, what comes afterwards. And, and there, are, there are organizations and equipments and uh, techniques that are, that are is, developed just to get that assault done and i'll talk about that and then and the plans for what was going to happen beyond d-day and then what actually uh, what actually came to pass and sort of uh beyond uh, beyond d plus one d plus three well have to get something to another another show but it sort of goes into you know, the rest of the support of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, operations great so so the background, as has as been said many times in other shows, the Canadian Army was very, very small at the beginning of the Second World War, 4,000 regulars total, and about uh, nominally about 80,000 reserves, but uh, most of those weren't, uh, weren't positions weren't manned. Uh, you know, there's a long wait in the UK that happens for the Canadians, which is frustrating, but also beneficial because we get to learn from the hard-won experience of uh, the other uh, Duke, if you like, uh, artilleries that are fighting in the desert and, and and a lot of the techniques and procedures that we use in Normandy are developed there that uh, that, that uh, we use. Um, the organization, the reorganization early on, there's a lot of restructure and lessons being learned from, from uh, the BEF in France and being applied to the forces. So the Canadian Army in, in the UK basically goes through a series of, of reorganizations that result from these lessons and so by 1944, they have a fairly robust and battle proven by others uh, organization of the artillery. And a little bit about, about the doctrine uh, that, uh, that, that under, underpins all this. And so, you know, that's, that's the, uh, the background. So the Royal Regiment of Canadian Artillery, as we call it, you know, there's only one, only three regular force batteries in 1939, one medium and one anti-aircraft battery, and, and that's it. 
There's only 750 regular army gunners in the Canadian Army in 1939, uh, and nominally 14,000 militia gunners uh, in 145 batteries. But many of those batteries hadn't fired a shot in years due to uh, budget restrictions, and uh, some of them were just paper batteries that were that were created uh, to to fit these large structures that the Canadian government created but never funded. So a uh, familiar story for some. And then by 1944, uh, you know, we, we have a, a massive organization, 30,000 or more gunners uh, deployed. Uh, by 44, of course, about a third, of two, a third to a half of the gunners are in Italy with the 1st Canadian Corps, but, you know, 15 field regiments, uh, six medium, two survey regiments, and, and 10, 10 formation headquarters. So a massive expansion from those 750 regulars uh, 14,000 reserve uh, militiamen, uh, most of whom start the war in very junior positions, and then of course the thousands of Canadians who join uh, just for the war, if you like, and get trained in Canada, trained in the UK, and the structures of training that are set up. Uh, you know, the Can Canada establishes its own artillery school separate from Lark Hill in the UK to train because of the capacity of Lark Hill. Is not great enough to meet the need, so we build our own artillery school uh, to meet that need. So, on guard in Britain, and uh, you know, by by forty two, all of the formations are uh, the major formations have arrived uh, in the UK. Um, the first division gets there right away in December thirty nine, but leaves for Italy in, in July of forty three. Uh, second division in forty, uh, up to the fifth, uh, the last to arrive is the fourth armored division in the October forty two. Uh, and those 300,000 Canadians who passed through uh, Aldershot uh, camp, and it's you know, 22,000 children born to Canadian soldiers in the UK, so there, there's other activities going on. Uh, but uh, the, the uh, reception and the, the, the Canadians receive in the UK, because they are, in December 39, they're pretty much the first Dominion troops to arrive uh, in the UK, who weren't all, you know, uh, so, so the reception of, of us coming to uh, coming to aid the motherland and uh, and then uh, gradually grow that into the uh, what, what becomes the first Canadian army. Uh, and just talk about the motherland there, David, just to interrupt for a second. Yeah. We've talked on the show previously about some of the inventiveness perhaps the New Zealanders and the Australians have shown with artillery in the Western desert. Was there anything in your experience uniquely Canadian that they brought to the table in terms of artillery or always the model more or less the same as Britain and everywhere else part of the empire? Uh, more or less, although the Canadians are later in the war in 44-45, the Canadians are the first to really exploit the, the rocket, the land mattress as it was called, uh, and develop that. Uh, there is a British battery as well, but the Canadians take the lead on that use it at Veritable. I think there were Dave, uh, David Grebstead's uh, article about the, uh, about the fire support to Operation Veritable. So that's that's one one thing that uh, that the Canadians sort of take the lead on, I would say. But uh, other than that, it's mainly the lessons coming from uh, from the desert, from the, as I call them, the, the, the main drivers of doctrinal change in the, in the British and Duke forces. Uh, the Canadians are mainly on, on as I say, on receive for most of that. And, right. And, uh, uh, for most of that, that period. So, and of course, what happens, this is sort of a busy slide, but it shows you the evolution of the, um, uh, of the organizations. And so up in the top right, 1939, and, and the, a lot of the stuff that's going on early in the war, both for Canadians and the British, is sort of legacy of the First World War. And the end of the First World War in 1918, uh, with the, the combined arms and the uh, mobile warfare that is going on there is sort of uh, taken as a lesson for the beginning of the Second World War. And so the structures are very similar, uh, the, the numbers of guns in a battery, uh, that, that sort of thing, and, uh, and, and the reliance uh, mainly on, still on landline or wire communication as opposed to wireless or radio. But as the, as the war progresses, the radios become more and more, uh, more, and more important. So when the, when the, when the uh, regiments mobilize in Canada in 1939, they mobilize with 24 guns, but in four batteries. Then they get to the UK and are reorganized as results from, from 1940. Uh, they're, they, they still want 24 guns, but only in two batteries, and now they have troops. So there's six guns in a troop. And then by 1942, for the Canadians, it happens in 1941 in the Royal Artillery, 
we come to the structure that sort of carries on for the rest of the war of three batteries of, of two troops each, each with four guns. And, it, and that comes from uh, the, the doctrine of the Royal Artillery and by default the Royal Canadian Artillery in terms of uh, how fire is requested. So in the Canadian and British model, the, the troop commander with his four guns is in command of those of those guns. He is the he is the forward observer, the captain who is forward with the infantry, and uh, he can guarantee the fire of those four guns at least. So when he when his infantry commander asks him for uh, uh, for fire, he can he can say I, I will get you. You will have my four guns, and I'll if we need more, I'll get more. And so that 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 uh, man uh, the guns from the lowest level, the one that is. Uh, sort of uniquely uh, uh, British Canadian Duke, if you like, uh, very different from the way the Americans or the French control their artillery. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and uh, so that, that it's not a request for fire, it's a fire order, I'm telling you to fire. So that they structure it that way. So the troop, they have six troop commanders in a, in a regiment and they have their six troops. And at least they will get that, that fire for you as an infantry uh, commander, but uh, usually get more uh, and um, the way that they get more uh, evolves uh, over, the, over the war uh, and, and relies on technology uh, radios for the most part uh, and the skill in, in switching fires and the controlling of fire across a whole core or even army front which is uniquely uh, uh, British or British Canadian and Duke uh, tech, uh, doctrine so by 44 uh, the, 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 the struggle that we, you know, the, the organization that we go into Normandy with is fairly standardized and that, that's, this is sort of a, a collage of images from those, uh, the British soldier D-Day by uh, Jean Boucherie books, but there's three batteries of guns and the headquarters, so that's pretty much what a regiment would look like on the parade square getting, getting inspected. Uh, so, you know, the, the four, four troops or six troops of four guns and uh, the, out, the forward observers and, and the various other support organizations that, uh, that uh, support it. Not, none the least, the, uh, the, the vehicles that move the ammunition around, which are uh, you know, uh, vital to that. Yeah. So you don't, don't have any guns, you don't, you don't have any ammunition, you don't have any, uh, don't have any fire. The, the, the artillery, you say that the weapon of the artillery is not the gun, it's the shell. Uh, that's, that's what does the damage. So uh, that's what you gotta focus on is delivering the shells to where the supported uh, arm commander wants them. So uh, I did mention a thing about, about doctrinal differences and uh, this sort of slide sort of illustrates. And this kind of comes from uh, where I sort of learned about this Morris was in a book called On Artillery by Bruce Dudmanson. It's sort of the On Infantry series, On Artillery, On Armor. Well, his, his discussion of the American artillery was uh, sort of uh, eye-opening for me in terms of how much uh, American military culture is based on the French military culture, uh, all the way from uniforms to, uh, to back in the Civil War days to uh, to doctrine coming out of the First World War, as they fought, the American Army fought alongside the French, not alongside uh, the British and Canadians. So my view is based on a culture of scarcity, scarcity versus abundance, and the American solution uh, to you need more artillery is to give you more artillery give you more artillery battalions. And so, so divisions in Normandy get assigned uh, extra artillery battalions if they're the, if they're the main effort. But, they, but it's more difficult to switch between divisions. Uh, you, get, you get assigned the resources the commander thinks you need, and you get on with the fight. Uh, on the British side, because of uh, a lack of resources to a certain extent, we need to be able to be flexible and switch those guns across the front. So we, so we develop technology and techniques to do that. Uh, I have already mentioned about uh, uh, the observers in the American system. Observers are very junior. They're second lieutenants or mm -hmm. sergeants who are calling down the, the fire. And they actually in, 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 they actually don't belong to the artillery unit. They belong to the infantry unit, in, uh, certainly in modern times. So the Second World War, I'm not 100% not sure on the American side. But uh, they certainly are very, very junior. And so they are making requests for fire. They are not uh, commanding the guns to fire. So uh, above, the, above the observer in the American system is what's called a fire direction center. 
and that's there where a captain or a major is deciding if I'm going to give you those guns or not, based on the wider uh, tactical situation and, and what's going on. Uh, I uh, just as a personal anecdote, I was uh, in an American exercise back in 1989, and I was an observer uh, asking for fire and for exactly same, the same target. Uh, separated by an hour, I got uh, a platoon of three guns the first time and a whole battalion the second time. And I had no idea why it was the same target, it was the same uh, thing, but that's what they told me I was getting, and I was happy to have a battalion on the second target, but uh, it wasn't my decision as the observer. Whereas in a, in a British or Canadian uh, doctrinal system, a foo being a captain, being an experienced officer, would decide what he needed uh, to shoot that target and would and would order that target. He would order a battery to fire, he would order a regiment to fire, and then it was up to the guns to organize to, to as much as possible meet that order. And if they couldn't, then maybe he would be told. Um, so you might not get what you order as an observer of the British system, but you, you decide as the guy on the ground. Right. Uh, so the captains, the captains who are there, and it's often a uh, corollary of that is because you have these senior captains up with the infantry, um, sometimes the command of the company falls to the foo because he's the senior guy left. And many, there are many, many uh, forward observers in the Canadian artillery who get the military cross uh, because they, have, they end up taking over the running of a defense or an attack after all the infantry officers are wounded or killed. Uh, in fact, uh, Britt Brit Smith, who was whose monument is on point 67 and who just turned 103 last week, uh, our senior artillery officer, uh, got the MC at Trotval Farm uh, when he was the sole officer left standing and, and uh, uh, fought off a German counterattack and, uh, and, and got his, uh, earned his medal that way. So that, because you have those senior guys there, it often falls to them uh, to take over from the infantry. That sort of a doctrinal difference that uh, sometimes isn't isn't quite uh, followed through or understood when you're talking about uh, the artillery and and as you said, Woody, that the, the British and Canadian armies is an artillery based doctrine. You know, we we want to use firepower, shells, not not flesh, steel, not flesh, and so the uh, the uh, the coordination of that fire and the delivery of that fire is a major effort. Um, I was in Normandy and. 2004 with a guy who had been a George, uh, George George Brown, of course, who'd been a company commander in the Regina Rifles. And he said uh, uh, that his job in the Second World War was to escort the foo across Europe. So, um, because he was the one who did all the killing. Uh, so, uh, but, it, it, but in order to do that, you need to have the structure, the doctrine, the communications, the infrastructure to, uh, to make that happen. So where does that come from? And I say on the shoulders of giants, there's two, two British gunners who, who basically organize this for the Duke forces. And uh, one is, is Sidney Kirkman, who was known as Monty's favorite gunner, uh, uh, by some have, have called him that. Uh, he goes with him from England uh, to the desert uh, with 8th Eighth, Eighth Army and basically runs the fire plan for El Alamein and, and basically Monty for once in his life doesn't interfere at all with that. He just lets Kirkman get on with it, tells him what he wants, and he trusts him from their experience together in, in England to, to get that done. So he, so Kirkman was not only a good gun, he later went on to be a division and a corps commander in the British Army by the end of the war in Italy. Um, so he left the guns after, uh, after the end of the African campaign, commanded the 50th division and then the 13th corps. And, and John um, Parshall and others are big fans of Kirkman. Kirkman came up several times in the Al Alamein series of shows, and you know, with, without you know telling you things about artillery, yeah. he came with the good experience and good method, and from it, from the UK, but also in North Africa, he looked at what you know. As I said, oh, the Kiwis were doing, the Aussies were doing, the South Africans are doing, and kind of borrowed little bits and pieces of ideas from there and adapted his already pretty good plan and 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 made it better. And I think that's that's where. The people from other countries, perhaps the American historians, admire him for for, for being a very um, strong will, but open to ideas as well. Yeah, exactly. And, and he, you know, flexible, adaptable, but he also thought about what he had to do, uh, and 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 basically this idea of command and control, which when you talk about command and control, are almost 
you know, the, the words flow together, they're seen as the same thing in many cases. But in the artillery, they're very different. Uh, command is is how is who decides where the guns go and who, who moves the guns, and control is who fires the guns. So Kirkman was the first to really codify in the British artillery that command needs to be centralized at the highest level, because there had been all sorts of fads, I feel like jock columns as they were called, and, and uh, of decentralizing the guns down to brigades, like form brigade groups, give the brigade what they need. And, and, you, and you, can, you can understand in the desert how that would come about, given the large distances, the huge space involved. And, and could you really get all the guns in a core to shoot at the same target anyway, because they were so dispersed, uh, the targets. Uh, but uh, he saw this as, and, and there were some sort of advocating, we don't need a divisional artillery at all. We just give all the guns to the brigades, and that's the way we'll fight the war. Sort of the, the camp group model, if you like. To a certain extent as well, take, looking at what the Germans are doing. Uh, whereas Kirkman said, no, we, we, we need to harness the, the massive firepower available to us as the British Army gets more and more guns, uh, as the 25-pounder comes out and replaces all the older guns, as medium artillery and heavier artillery starts to appear in the desert, because it really isn't a lot at the beginning. Um, that if there has to be a way to, to coordinate this and have the commander who's in charge and Monty or the corps commander, whoever's given that authority, decide who where those guns are going to go, who they're going to support, uh, and how many rounds. So that was that was new basically, um, and and it was Kirkman with the Eighth Army that, that that sort of codified all this into doctrine. But on, on the other side, the control is we want the guy on the ground to be the one who's asking for the fire because he's the one who sees the target. We don't want to uh, have massive bar you know, barrages are useful, and, and but need a lot of planning, and barrages are used throughout the, the desert and into Italy and, and even into Normandy. When you don't know where the target is, sometimes you have to use a barrage to make sure you hit uh, hit at least some of the time. But the guy on the ground, the, the forward observer, is the one who can see the target, and and he he is empowered in this system to uh, to ask to to ask but to command the guns to shoot. And then it's up to the people behind him, you know, his regiment and division gunners to try and get him what he needs to do the job. But it's 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 uh, putting that judgment call on the guy on the ground, uh, the forward observer. Therefore, you need an experienced guy out there, not a very junior uh, second lieutenant or sergeant as the American system. So that's that's Kirkman's contribution, and it's a it's a it's a ma major one. The other, the other one is, is Jack Parham, and Jack Parham basically, uh, one thing I didn't know about him until I was doing a little more research for this is that he was one of the first to start air observation because he, he was a commercial pilot before the war. So he had a pilot's license and he wanted to see there's got to be a way we can use these aircraft in the artillery. So he pushed for and developed aero P uh, parties and eventually there are aero P squadrons in, in the, in the that, that, that that do that job. And I uh, jokingly always say that um, the Army realized that it was easier to teach a gunner how to fly than to teach a pilot how to shoot. So uh, so, so, they, so the gunners are actually flying the planes. And I've met many uh, Aero P pilots here in Canada over the years, veterans, and, and the things that they did was just un unbelievable in those little Osters, uh, Oster planes by themselves, running the radio, adjusting the fire, flying the plane, uh, and, the, and the way that they flew the, the, the aircraft to, because uh, you know, they were an extremely vulnerable aircraft. So those those techniques were started by Parham. He was the one who was pushing for that in the, in the Royal Artillery. The other thing he does is come up with a way of concentrating fire rapidly across the Corps or Army or Division front. Uh, how do you do that? And so you needed very simple procedures, and his byword was always, Simplify, simplify, simplify. Uh, make things as easy as possible. So he comes up with uh, on the screen there those various code words: Mike, Uncle, Victor, Yoke, William, and Yoke. That a foo would say into his microphone: Mike, target, Mike, target, Mike, target, and give the coordinates. And then every gun in the regiment would then shoot at that target. So 72 guns would fire. And if it was a big enough target, he would start asking for an Uncle target or a Victor target, all the way up up to Yoke. Um, the one uh, that I know of in Canadian artillery uh, history is from Italy when they fired a William target at the town of Aquino in, in, our, in uh, 
the Leary Valley. And uh, so all the guns of 8th Army that were available fired at this target. And uh, the observers said it was like someone lifted up the town, turned it upside down, and dropped it back down again. So, uh, but that took coordination, that took expert communication, because you wanted this to happen. You didn't want this to take a day to happen. You know, in the First World War, getting an army to shoot at the same target would take, you know, take a day of coordination. It would happen, but it would take a lot of coordination. Second World War, you want to be able to call on a radio, and within 15 to 20 minutes, you want to have all the guns that are available in the Corps or the Army shooting at that target. So, but uh, certainly Mike targets, they're for the regiment, and uncle targets were, were much more much more common than uh, the higher level ones. But it was there as a uh, as a tool available. And it started to be trained into the artillery in 1942, 1943. So the Canadians are getting all these lessons back in the UK and uh, reorganizing their training. Even back in Canada, you know, the artillery schools are, are, are absorbing these lessons and, uh, and teaching that to the new, uh, new officers, new NCOs that are coming through the system. And so, of course, by Normandy times, Parham is the, the Brigadier Royal Artillery, the senior gunner in the Second British Army. So he's there in Normandy, um, putting these uh, these tools uh, to work, working for uh, uh, Miles Dempsey. So that's sort of the doctrinal background and, and where things come from as to how we get to, from 1939 to uh, to uh, 1944. And so now we're going to move on to uh, talking about. Uh, do you know if there's any particular questions that I haven't, uh, haven't uh, been looking at? But uh, I think we're good. Move on. Very good. So on Juno Beach, uh, the, the uh, Canadian guns on Juno Beach and British guns, by the way, on Juno Beach. Um, so the third division is uh, only selected for to be the, the assault division in July of 1943. Um, up to that point, there have been a lot of assumptions about who was going to be the lead unit. Everyone thought the 1st Division because they were there first and they were where all the regular army guys were. But they went off to Italy uh, in, in July of 43. Uh, uh, then it was the 2nd Division, but the 2nd Division had been wrecked at Dieppe. And so it wasn't really ready, although not a lot of gunners were, uh, were involved. There were about 150 gunners at Dieppe, um, mainly anti-aircraft uh, gunners. But... Um, it was decided that they needed, as, as an assault division, they weren't they weren't to be ready in time, so it was handed off to the third division. So uh, training gets very intense and is now very focused because up to this point, although you know it, it mainly been anti-invasion training exercises, sort of getting ready in a generic way. Now the third division is getting ready for a specific task. They know that they are going to be the assault division on one of the beaches wherever they're going to land, which they don't know, of course, at the beginning. Um, one of the things that, one of the techniques, and, and, and some of the guns take this very seriously, there's a story about the 12th Field Regiment, that they they had been pra they practiced going up and down scramble nets to get in and out of landing craft, and, and in and out of, uh, the, from, from, the, from the landing ships down to the landing craft. So the 12th uh, Artillery Regiment erected a, land, a scramble net outside of their headquarters, anyone coming to visit them had to climb up and down the scramble deck to come into the headquarters. So uh, <laughs> they note that vis visits dropped off dramatically to the regimental headquarters and when they started doing this, but uh, sort of like having a chin-up bar outside the CO's office or whatever, that they, they, they took it seriously and the way they, uh, the way they went. So um, the idea and, the, and of course the thing that everyone retains from June Beach is of course the firing of the guns from the landing craft. And this had been started uh, with 25 pounders before the self-propelled guns were assigned to, uh, to, to the, 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 all of the British and Canadian divisions landing at, at Juno Beach or at, on the beaches. Uh, they had decided to, to, to try this with 25 pounders. And so they actually went up and, and did this test. Uh, once again, it was the, the 12th Regiment, 12th and 13th Regiment, lashing the guns to the landing craft and then firing uh, up in Scotland uh, on ranges. And they, uh, they, uh, it was judged a success. In other words, they got shells to land roughly where they wanted them to land. The challenge was, how do you get those guns off the landing craft uh, once you've, they're all facing the wrong way. You have to sort of manhandle them mm. off the off the landing craft because the, the, the gun tractors are on the, on the landing craft too. But how's that all going to work? And so it would have delayed the, uh, the ability of the guns to come on to, to the 
landing onto the beaches after they've done this task. They also experimented initially with a thousand meter uh, barrage, if you like, a, a depth of a thousand meters. But uh, they learned that a thousand meters is a long way uh, on, on Juno Beach. If you think about from the from the uh, Juno Beach Center, a kilometer inland is is quite a ways. And so, do, they, do we really need to shell all that way? And do we want to focus on the beach? And so they, they, they reduced it down to 200 meters. So it was a 200 meter rotating barrage of, of shells as the landing craft came in, which means meant that the gunners had to be a lot more uh, nimble in making corrections. The other thing that happens, of course, is 19th Army Field Regiment arrives and, and is added so the, the, to the third division. So they have four, uh, four regiments now instead of three. And the, the, the decision to re-equip the, uh, the whole of the Duke artillery with self-propelled uh, guns. So the 3rd British and the 3rd Canadian uh, get uh, 105 millimeter priests, uh, whereas the 50th gets all sextons for their, uh, their self-propelled guns. So all self-propelled, much, much simpler to organize firing from a landing craft because they can just drive right off at the end of it. Uh, and they had a little better protection as they're on the, you know, working the guns on the, uh, on the landing craft. So the other thing that, so that that's the sort of the beginning. That, the other thing, of course, is that more foo parties. Uh, at Dieppe, there was one foo party per battalion landing. Um, so on the main beach at Dieppe, there were two foo parties, both of which were immediately neutralized when they landed. Now there's a foo party per company. Every company has their own foo which is more than what the doctrine says. The doctrine says there are two foos uh, supporting a battalion, and the battalion commander decides who gets the foo, whereas for the assault, every company had a, had a foo. So they have to generate more foo parties from within the organizations that they have. So uh, they may have been less, less senior guys in some of the depth companies. And David, just a quick question for you. At the, at the planning level, um, a lot of things have to be brought ashore on D-Day, you know, infantry, armor, artillery, logistics, support, etc. Were there any debates about or arguments about the allocation of LCTs? Because, you know, because there, we all know that there isn't, there aren't spare LCBPs and LCTs and LSTs for, for, for Operation Overlord. We've got enough, but we haven't got many extras. So were there deliberations about how to best use the the craft and, and you know how how much did they have to fight for artillery or who were the who were the people who were wanting artillery and who were those who perhaps wanted armories was there any kind of such debate yes and, and so you, you, of course this is the first time in, in the sort of the duke experience that we're doing this because we didn't do it in sicily we didn't do it in salerno we didn't do it in anzio uh to have artillery firing from landing craft so someone has decided that we needed the more artillery support we need, the better. And people like uh, Stanley Todd, who is the third division, and it's not a Canadian decision. It's it's a it's yeah. an ally or a, a Commonwealth at least, if not ally, because we have to get the guns, not only the landing craft, we have to get the guns from the Americans. So yeah. we have to say, you know, we want uh, you know 70, over 150 M7 priests diverted from American uh, artillery units to British artillery units. British and Canadian. So that decision as well is taken at a higher level. And there's people like, uh, well, Parham, who's at Second Army, and uh, and, and uh, the higher levels that are deciding those allocation and resources. By the time it gets to uh, the divisions, it's already a done deal. Here's your here's your landing craft. Uh, they need uh, they need three, uh, sorry, they need six for each uh, regiment. There's only four guns in, in, in a landing craft. So, uh, so that's 24, 24 landing craft per beach, uh, at least, uh, if not more. Uh, actually, I mean, it's, it's more than that. Um, so they have to be, and, and it's, and it's the, the availability of them. Uh, you know, if they'd done the landings in 43, it wouldn't, they wouldn't have had them. Uh, so the, the ability of the system to produce landing craft, and then the priority becomes fire support on the beach. And, and I think it's just the the perception that we want to do everything possible to make sure that we're that we're providing a maximum amount of fire support to the guys who are landing on the beach, and, and uh, uh, one of them is this uh, is this field artillery firing from from landing crew. Uh, and so, just one more yeah, question: you, you, People are talking about yeah. kind of the word saturation. So, for for the actual invasion coming in with 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 the priests on on LCTs, it's more about just getting fire 
at the beach generally without specifically targeting um you know precise buildings or embracement it's just lots and lots of firepower to be overwhelming is that what we're talking about right and, and certainly the analysis after the fact although everyone judged that that, that the it had been executed well what the, what the, what we did uh, what the gunners did uh the actual effect on specific targets was was negligible but uh, as I've said to people standing on Juno Beach, that you, have, you, you, have, you can never gainsay the suppressive effect of noise and smoke and, and crap flying around you as you're sitting in your bunker, uh, pointing your uh, your weapon out to sea or along the beach to try and stop the Canadians. And so, just that simple and and noise, the the, you know, yeah. the suppressive effect of noise. So for about uh, 30 minutes before they land, and it's just before they land. It's only 10 minutes before the. Uh, the troops land. You've got this rolling barrage going back and forth across the beach, from uh, in the Canadians' case, uh, you know, 96 guns. It's when you, when you do the math of the uh, you know, the length of the beaches and the numbers of guns, it's not a lot of. It's not a. It's not a uh, extremely heavy barrage, but it is uh, it is focused and it can be to a certain extent adjusted as they go in by the by the, the pilot boats, if you like. And the, right. But uh, it's really just a, a barrage raking fire along the beach for the 200 meters from the waterline uh, uh, to uh, across those first uh, areas of bunkers is what. Uh, and you say the, the suppressive, it's, it's a suppress, it's a, you're not going to knock out any bunker with, a, with a, even a 105 millimeter shell hitting those bunkers is not going to knock it out. Uh, but you'll, you'll ring the bells and, uh, of the guys inside and maybe suppress them so that 10 minutes later when the infantry show up, they're still not at uh, 100%. Hopefully, yeah. But uh, it's uh, and I think it's a question of it's it's a it's a tool in the toolbox that we don't want to leave unused. Yes, yeah. makes if sense. We didn't use if we didn't use it, then you can say, well, why didn't you try? Why didn't you fire fire those guns? You, you, know, you had the technique, you could have done it. And so so let let's make it happen. Um, so the uh, uh, so that's where where it comes from that. Brilliant. Um, the next, and of course, the, the 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 regiments themselves are reorganized for the for the landing, because it's it's a very specific uh, task: assault a beach, capture your objectives, and then go back to being normal, if you like, uh, field gunners. And so the standard organization, the CO, would have been with the infantry brigade commander, the brigadier. The battery commanders would have been with the battalion COs, and then the forward observation officers would have been with two of the four company commanders in the battalion. So that's. That's how they trained up until they got the assault task. That's how uh, they were being used in Italy uh, with the guns. However, for the assault, uh, because we have more battalions uh, or regiments of guns supporting, the CO is actually with the infantry battalion. So every infantry battalion CO, lieutenant colonel, has an artillery lieutenant colonel with him providing advice and uh, support for uh, on, on the use of his guns. The battery commanders have three very different roles. Um, one is the with a fire control officer, so he's the guy in the middle deciding uh, to move the move the fire of the guns, adjust the fire of the guns. So he is the one communicating with the LCTs. The other one is the deployment officer, and he's one in one of the first landing craft or probably second row of landing craft with the infantry, going forward to mark out the gun positions where the guns are going to go. So get off the beach, find the locations for the guns, which they've all done their map recce and they know where they're going to try and put them. But reality gets in the way, of course, and, and you know roads can be blocked and buildings are destroyed. And so it's his job to go and sight those guns. And then the, the last major is, is with the landing officer. So he stays on the beach, and as the guns come in, he sends them to the right direction. So they have very different jobs. And uh, they also take, those guys take a lot of casualties compared to other uh, gunners. There's, there's about four, two majors killed and three majors uh, wounded amongst the artillery, and so it's a, a relatively high percentage for that rank in uh, uh, compared to normal, if you like, uh, usage. And then the forward observation officers, there's 12 of them, one with each company uh, company commander. And they, uh, in some cases, share the fate, you know, the Regina Rifle Company, that the company commander's landing craft is completely destroyed and blown up on a mine. The Fu is also killed in that, uh, in that uh, incident. But we have way more uh, redundancy of of effort. So we have instead of having one FU landing at Dieppe with the battalion, we have we have tw uh, four FUs landing with that battalion. So there will be somebody who can take on the role and, and adjust fire as they push in land after they've landed. Right. 
And so the guy who's running this is uh, I call Uncle Stanley, as he's known in the Canadian Artillery, Stanley Todd. He's the CRA, the Commander of Royal, uh, Royal Artillery of the Third Canadian Division, uh, and uh, lived to a ripe old age when he died in 1998. So I, I actually met him a wow. couple of times. Um, he was uh, sorry, 1996. He was 98. Um, uh, and so yeah, he was a, a well-known and revered uh, gunner in Canada, and uh, horribly deaf, so he had to yell very, very loudly in his ears. To, <laughs> yes, he was very much the cliché gunner. <laughs> but uh, uh, so his plan, if you like, uh, was to coordinate those that fire, and so he took the resources that were given to him by uh, by both the Navy, the Air, and the, and the artillery, and, and planned that uh, that uh, support. Uh, the, the the challenge for him is, of course, the doctrine that we've been talking about is very much a centralized doctrine. But in the landing, everything is very much decentralized, and you have not a lot of control over what's going on. So, to, so Todd has to balance those two things. He, he needs to gain control of the guns so he can use that technique of massing the guns at various targets, using them like a 72-gun battery, as, as Monty talked about in the, in the desert. Uh, but he has to accommodate the fact that it's going to be chaotic and hard to control, and he's not even going to be on the ground with his headquarters until the end of the day on D-Day. So how does he? How do we do that? And so he has to uh, come up with. And there is some criticism. I talked about Mark Miller in his in his book uh, Stopping the Panzers, which you've got right beside me here, talks about uh, some of the criticisms of of uh, or the I would say criticism. It's the, the consequences of these decisions. Uh, that have happened on D plus one and D plus two for the Canadians when they go south uh, towards uh, mm. towards the Combine Yo Highway. Consequences of structuring yourself to work independently when you have a doctrine that wants you to work cooperatively. And so, when do you hand that over? When do you establish that control? And so, for for Todd, uh, it's um, it's a challenge. Uh, another challenge for historians is that the uh, the war diary of the RCHA, or RCA Brigade, or the headquarters, was destroyed and was only rewritten about three months later. So it's it's almost useless as a historical document. Uh, it's a lot of weather reports and uh, and and, uh, and, ca and casualties. So it's not a very useful uh, war diary. And Todd, being you know, uh, having been uh, in the artillery for a long time after the war, and to to a certain extent, understandably, was very proud of what the gunners did and was very reluctant to admit. Uh, fault uh, in the plan. So he cop copied that a bit from Monty, perhaps, but, uh, but he, would, he would say things, every, everything went according to plan, everything worked well. When really, when you look at the detail, and Mark does that in great detail in stopping the Panzers, uh, shows that, that there were challenges and problems that were uh, resulted from, from, a, from, a, from a decision made not just by him, but by all the gunners who were, who were uh, it just happened that the Canadians suffered the most the strongest counterattacks on D plus one, and but you can also make the case, David, across the board on on in Normandy that the 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 effectiveness on D Day is based on expectation of of, of plan, thorough planning. You know where you're landing, you know what you're doing, and then at some point after D Day, D plus six seven, all, all the units were in place. But there was always be that uncertainty of D plus one, D plus two of how far they've got in land, how much space there is to bring in the, the supplies, how much ammunition has come ashore. So I, I feel it's it's as much as I agree with Mark Milner, judging the performance uh, or uh, effectiveness of any kind of unit uh, in, within the first sort of 48 hours, 72 hours of D-Day, there's lots of variables there that come into play. As you say, there, the German counterattacks, the beachhead being in some places kind of beyond where they're expecting, other places not as far as they're expecting it. A lot of... A lot of um, a lot of um, yeah variables to 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 to, to, to cause yeah. headaches for everybody. I think that that period. Yeah, there's a lot of friction points there, and uh, and and this is the first time. Well, besides training, this is the first time they're using these guns, these priests, in actual operations and, and uh, you know, uh, firing them in support of uh, of the infantry. So Todd has a lot on his shoulders. Uh, he does he does well in the rest of Normandy. Ends up being the core, uh, our senior artillery in in Second Canadian Corps. Uh, and so, uh, and eventually, uh, the, the Colonel Commandant, you know, the senior ceremonial cutter after the war. So, one thing that's pointed out by Mark again is the allocation of artillery. 
those little artillery regiments or batteries there in the slide. That you know, being in the center in the in that open plain gets a lot of resources. But uh, but but uh, you know, the third British, the fiftieth Northumbrian gets a lot too, and and it's it's not a not a huge difference. Where the where the Canadians get more is they're getting more things that are arriving after D-Day. Uh, the, the medium regiment, the uh, the core artillery, the core anti tank regiment, which is which is the only core anti tank level uh, anti tank unit in uh, available, and Crocker gives it to Third Canadian Division. So, uh, uh, and you have the and the Marine uh, Marine uh, Centaur batteries that are there as well. Uh, so, so that there are British uh, Royal Marine gunners in support. Whereas on the other side, in Third British Division, they they basically survive with their with their organic artillery. And the, and the guns that land after D-Day are actually supporting the 6th Airborne Division. So they're actually moving off to cross the, uh, the, the canal and, and, and support uh, uh, support them. So the, the, the emphasis definitely is on the center and the, uh, and if you like, the right of the uh, Commonwealth uh, uh, position. So uh, we've got up to the organization. Now we're going to do a little bit of a, see if this works, animation of, uh, of how it actually worked firing from the sea. So... Uh, that's a famous famous picture of 14 field regiment firing their firing their guns from the landing craft tank as they as they come in um, from a long way off they start 11 11 kilometers out so there's just some some photos of that and the, the thing that that boggles the mind of modern gunners when they see this is just the number of rounds of shells that are stacked around the guns uh, 100 to 150 rounds that are stacked just for the barrage going in per gun so on a on an lct you would have 500 to 600 shells like this prepared to be fired lying on the deck stacked ready to ready to be handed up to the gunners and just the safety officer in me sort of shivers go down my spine of, of the, the the potential for disaster uh, of this hap this happened and uh, and indeed before d-day uh the luftwaffe bombed uh one of these landing craft and four of the guns were destroyed. Uh, and, and the amazing thing is within 24 hours, everything had been replaced. Uh, the guns, the shells, the waterproofing was all done in 24 hours and they're ready to go again. But um, that's uh, just, just the shows of the cramped quarters and the, and the uh, I'm sure there were not very many, uh, there were a lot of deaf gunners at the end of this. So, and of course they're using the, the priests as we talked about, um, uh, the uh, about 11,000 uh, uh, meter range uh, crew of eight, and uh, very much liked by the crews that had them. They were very reluctant to give them up when they had to later in the Normandy campaign. But uh, um, uh, that's what was on four on each landing craft. And this thing that that uh, was used it's a naval rangefinder actually, the Vickers range clock, which was put on each of the landing craft tank so that they could set the uh, ranges and, and you set the you set the, uh, the the rate of change how fast are you going uh, uh, what's the range and then you can make corrections with a little red dial in the middle and so as you as you move forward it's telling you you're now 8,000 meters away you're now 6,000 meters away or yards in, in the case in this case and because on, on, the, uh, on the on the 105 millimeter priest you had to actually put an angle in mills it wasn't 25 pounder you just put the range on the site it was, it was 6,000 yards, you put 6,000 yards on the site. With the uh, 105, you had to convert that to a to an angle and put that on the, on the site to, uh, to lay the gun. So that, uh, that little naval device was on each landing craft tank, uh, giving them, let's say, set the rate of change and they would set corrections to move the, if the shells were landing short or long, they could use the red dial in the middle to, to adjust it to, in terms of how far they were shooting. So that's uh, part of the technique, and then this is just a little a little schematic of, of a generic beach, and just for those who don't you know, see all the mines, wire, and machine guns, and any tank guns, on a generic beach. Uh, and then what you're going to see uh, this is a, an enlarged version. This is a landing craft tank Mark II, a uh, Type II, I believe. Although I defer to, uh, to Mr. Fisher on my landing craft uh, typology, but uh, with four uh, M7 priests in it, so. So on the, on the day when they arrived, they, they would be in a line, I mean, actually two lines of, of a landing craft tank, and they were supposed to start shooting at 9,000 yards. Uh, however, because of all... Are we still there? 
Yep, still yep. happening. Yep. Okay. Those things. Are, you know, so um, they actually had to start firing uh, earlier because they to meet the timing. So they started firing. Uh, so they were, they were, everything was set up to fire at nine thousand yards and go in thirty minutes of, of shooting and then turn around and come back. But they had to start at eleven thousand yards. So they had to do all that on the fly while they were out there at sea. Uh, and and uh, so the, the amazing uh, uh, skill of the gunners to do that. And so they started at 7.05, 11,005 yards. You know, so there's you know, the line of shells running across the beach. And they're firing about three to five rounds per minute, depending on the ability of the gun detachment that's in the, the, the gun. So they figured that each gun fired about 100 to 150 rounds uh, as they came in. So 30 minutes, five rounds a minute, That's 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 a lot of moving shells around. So those guys uh, uh, knew, knew their stuff. So then as as then as they start firing, as the landing craft move in, well, they keep firing at the same range and the shells advance up the beach with the landing craft. And as they keep going in again, so they get to their 200 meters, uh, another another little way in. And then at 7.06, so a minute later, this is, this is every minute this has happened, they shift the fire to 11,300 yards and start again. So every minute from uh, 7:05 to 7:35, they're 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 like lowering the range uh, as they move forward, but continuing to fire. So there'd be a brief pause. They put a new elevation on the gun, start firing again. And so that's what they did using that range clock to let them know if they're maintaining their speed. They're supposed to be advancing at a steady six knots, uh, about 12,000 yards per uh, per hour. So, so 200 yards is about a minute's worth of traveling. So they, they can keep doing that another minute till they get within uh, 2,000 yards of the, of the beach. So they empty guns, fire their last rounds, and then they circle around to go back to the back of the column to come in last. So they're ahead of the infantry doing this, ahead of the tanks. And then they circle, turn around, go back to the rear of the column. And then 10 minutes later, this is for... Uh, uh, the beach at Corso, really, this is the, mm -hmm. the timings here. It's, it's a little bit later for the uh, Bernier Beach. 7.45, the uh, Royal Winnipeg Rifles land on the uh, west side of the Sul, and 7.55, the Regina Rifles land right in front of the town. And so then after the guns have circled around, if it's about an hour later, that they start to land. So they come to the, to the back and start uh, start landing uh, the guns. So that's, that's the technique that is used. They're using radar as well. They're... they're it, they're sort of pilot boats. They were motor launches that were in, in between the, the rows that were using a radar to, to check the range and make sure the range was, was good. They were also using uh, uh, landmarks. Uh, fortunately, all the church steeples in the towns were relatively intact, so they could sort of figure out where they make sure they were in the right place and, uh, and, uh, and, and do this, uh, this shift. So at the end of this hour, our, our half hour of firing, they, they fired... Uh, between 100 and uh, 150 rounds per gun onto the beach. So wow. sweeping it in per gun. So so then the guns come off the beach, and that's a whole other story. The, the, as, as we know, the, the beaches are very uh, are congested. The exits from the beach, particularly in Corso, because of the, the, the uh, I'd say slowness, but the deliberate nature of clearing the town of Corso that the Regina Rifles go through, and they have a, a plan to clear block by block uh, the, the, the town. And uh, so the guns end up firing from the beach initially, some of them, uh, and then and then are moved inland to, to, to gun positions. And there's a famous uh, engagement outside of Bernier where uh, a troop of the 14th Field Regiment deploys on the south side of the town. And basically, I go into the site and, and you say there's an 88 millimeter gun or an anti-tank gun of some sort. On the, on the crest of the hill in front of them, there's really nothing they can do about that. They just get picked off one by one, the four guns. And there's a little monument there now that uh, Garth uh, Garth Webb's regiment, so we had a, a monument put there, but that's just the, uh, the, uh, the, the the luck of the draw in terms of where they were deployed. They were, they were still not cleared of, of enemy positions in front of them. Mm. And- uh, Do you mind so, if we so, do a few questions about D-Day before we move on? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and sure. try, and, try and rattle through them fairly quickly. So several people have asked this. Peter O'Connor is saying, readaptability, what sorts of flexibility in terms of shell types and fusing air burst contact delayed action were available uh, for June the 6th, and then does it change later on? 
Yeah, the, so there's all sorts of different shells and fuses. Of course, for the barrage, they're just using strict plain HE, but you have uh, smoke rounds, that mainly chemical smoke, we call it hexachlorothene smoke. Uh, the, the way to get airburst at this point in the war is with a mechanical time fuse. It's a clockwork fuse. So you calculate the length of the time of flight, you back off a couple of seconds, and you set the, the clock uh, clockwork fuse on the, on the fuse to explode in the air. Uh, not none, none of that is done on on the D-Day because they want they, they, they want the shells to, to explode into the ground. Um, there is a there is a cap you can put on the shells for for concrete piercing, um, but uh, not so not used initially and, and fairly rare. Uh, in, certainly with twenty five pounders, twenty five pounders are a relatively light uh, light shell, uh, and uh, and and illumination of course you have a you can fire a flare shells, but uh, for this. Purpose, they would have a standard loadout in the in the actual priest that they, they wouldn't touch any of those rounds going in on D-Day. They would use all those rounds that were on the deck, and so and indeed underneath each of those uh, guns was what, uh, called a porpoise, uh, which was basically a sled that carried another forty or fifty rounds that they dragged behind them. That was supposed to be the, the shells they would use initially, uh, so they wouldn't have to use their standard loadout on the, on the priest. So. Uh, there, there is a, lo a lot of different ammunition to be used. Uh, if you want to use it in great numbers, it takes a bit of coordination and, and dumping and planning. But for, for small missions, you know, Fu could call for an airburst uh, 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 mission uh, for his troop or maybe the regiment, but he couldn't fire that for an hour. You'd have right. to you'd have to plan to get those kind of amounts of ammunition. Okay, a couple more, then we then we must move on because I've got a hard getaway, folks. Today, but Ian is asking, <laughs> were there any limits on the number of shells fired per gun in the early days of invasion? And I'm, I'm assuming they've been given some ideas of how the loading tables will work and what resupply is going to go it come in. But have they kind of got Plan B, Plan B, Plan C, depending on what ammunition is available? They well, they 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 have this sort of as you say, there's a there's a flow has been established as to how much ammunition is going to come up ashore, and that. Uh, it's called the ammunition supply rate that the gunners right. use. So how many how many rounds are coming ashore, and therefore how much can be used? So you would in in certain cases, and it didn't really happen early in the, you know, too much in Normandy, but you would say you only have 50 rounds per day per gun at this point in in this because we're saving up. We're trying to build up that supply rate for a Goodwood, for a Verit, for a for a you know a, a switchback or whatever. So, so the, the rate of supply is fairly fixed, and uh, and the the gunner the gunner planners at the higher level have to uh, dump uh, ammunition and plan for that. At the regimental and the and the battery level, they're just they, they get what they get and they use what they what they what they get and they may be told to restrict the number of rounds. But early on for D-Day, there was an extremely detailed calculation of how many rounds they wanted to use. Uh, the challenge became, you know, with the storm and all that, uh, you know, that's, that, that radically disrupts the flow of ammunition on the 18th of June when the, when the mm. great storm yes. happens. And so that changes all the plans because uh, they, uh, they have to recalibrate how, how, how fast the ammunition is coming into Normandy and where they can, uh, uh, therefore, Epsom is, is delayed uh, and, and all the consequences of that. Okay, and then last one, and I'll hand it back to you. The last one is... Yep. Did the planners uh, involve the idea to not bomb landmarks that could help sightings for artillery? Because you talked about the use of landmarks coming in. So was there an actual plan to try and avoid hitting church towers? Or does that then become the, 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 the danger of the fact that there might be Germans using it as well? Right. And, and so once, the, once, once they land, I don't think there was a deliberate, they deliberately did not want to destroy these things before. And A, they didn't want to tip their hand a little as to where we were going to land. Uh, they were useful landing, uh, and as you because as you know, each of those church steeples is very different yep. along the coast, and and it's very easy to orient yourself if you're coming ashore in a landing craft. But once they land, and if, if someone's in the church tower using it as a as a uh, observation or sniper post, then it's laws of war say so you can blow that blow that up. Uh, there's, there was no uh, care or consideration. If, if the enemy was using it, then it was a legitimate target. So back to you. Let's let's try and plow through. Right. I do apologize right. for having a bit of a hard getaway we're, today. It's just we're not someone's to, birthday. To. Right. So after D-Day, uh, you know, there's 17 officers and 40 gunners or casualties on D-Day. High relative officer casualty rate compared to later in the, in the war. And then the 
the organization for the assault is changed into what the organization to support the initial push south. So there's things called what I call they're called frags, field regiment artillery groups that are that are organized to support each of the lead brigades as they go south. So there's uh, the assault on D-Day, and there's the 12th and 14th frag that are going to support the 7th and the 8th brigade as they move south. Uh, sorry, 7th and the 9th brigade as they move south to the Oak Line, the Combayou uh, Railroad, which is the you know the limit of penetration initially. This is sort of slowed down because you can see on the map there the, the German counterattack on D-Day causes Croker to, to order a hard stop, a dig in uh, on, at, at the end of D-Day. So they don't quite get as far south as they want to, but the next day uh, they do. And this is the plan. This is taken from Mark's book. This is the plan of what they wanted to get to by D plus three, where all these guns that were coming to support the Canadians, where would they be? And you can see behind each brigade, there are three, four regiments of guns supporting each of them. And they're, and they're fairly close. I mean, you know where Bretville Loge is, is, well, at Bray, which is only about two kilometers back, there were 72 guns would be set up there in, in the field supporting the 7th Brigade. So uh, just a massive amounts of fire. But there is a, 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 a line, I'm sorry, like the River Neu, which runs down the middle here, is the, is the boundary between these two organizations. And the way radios and command and control are set up, there's not a lot of communication that can happen between them until the headquarters of the division is set up. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons, one of the one of the causes for the problem on the on the uh, on the seventh of June. So there's the red line, as sort of the, the divisor. This is the, the depiction of the action on the seventh and then the eighth of, of, of June, when the ninth brigade on the on the right is counterattacked by the twelfth SS and pushed back. They have difficulty getting their fire because the guns are back at Benny sur Mer at, at the cemetery. Actually, where the cemetery in Benny is was actually the gun position of the thirteenth field regiment. And uh, that's at maximum range. It's, a, it's about 11 kilometers, almost exactly, to Saint Contest from Benny. So you're, you're firing at maximum range, and, and, uh, and the guns are supposed to be moving south. So they have a, a hard time getting any fire from the guns initially. And also their naval gunfire, forward observ observation officer bombardment, can't get in touch with uh, HMS Belfast, which is also supposed to be sorting, uh, supporting this. So the seventh. None of this, none of this system works very well. The Germans have more guns than we do supporting this attack. The next day, on the night of the seventh and the eighth and the ninth, the system is set up, and so across the other side of this red line, where the seventh brigade fights at Bretville and, and Puteau, you have those resources of guns that that basically stomp the, the twenty six SS Panzer Regiment as it makes its attacks. Uh, there's, there's accounts of the gunner, the, the infantry doesn't even realize that attacks have started because the artillery just crushes them before they even start to get out of the, out of the wheat fields. Wow. Uh, so they don't even, the, the Regina rifles don't even realize that an attack has happened because the foo has spotted them, called the regiment down on them, and they just, and it just stops. Uh, so, so that doctrine and, and the British Canadian way of fighting is, happens on the left, but it doesn't happen on the right. On those first two days, and the and the criticism that Mark let, uh, uh, you know wields is that we go back a slide. These guns on the left are there while the the Ninth Brigade is 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 undergoing its its a cavalry, if you like. So why can't they shoot and support? It's only two kilometers away. They could probably hear the battle, but there's no communications. There's no radios. There's no way to, to call for that fire uh, uh, until the division headquarters is established. So, uh, so the uh, the divisional head, uh, control is reestablished re about D plus two, D plus three. Uh, they get the headquarters down, and then greater gunner numbers grow as we uh, as as more formations arrive. The second Canadian Agra, the medium guns, with the uh, the only French Canadian artillery regiment that deploys to Normandy. The second division, the fourth division, Corps and Army troops. So eventually, six hundred and forty guns and more than ten thousand gunners are deployed into Normandy and. and uh, Picture there is of the artillery memorial at Point 67, just south, uh, north of Saint Martin de Fontenay, uh, and that gun is oriented on Trocval Farm. It's a, it's a Brit Smith's troop. It's depicted as, and it's if you put it, you put the right charge shell in, the, in that gun and fired it, it would hit Trocval Farm, which would not please the farmer very much. But that's the way it was uh, oriented to, uh, to, uh, to commemorate that. Uh, 
So that's uh, that's my the, the gunner story on D-Day in Normandy, and uh, there's lots lots of stuff to tell later on or further on. And, and, I, and I didn't touch the any tank guns at all because it's a really a separate separate story. But uh, hope, uh, I'll take any other questions or we can move along. Well, we've got about five ten minutes for questions. So brilliant stuff, David. And um, the, my first broad question uh, for you is: is someone who is a gunner? It's on your shirt there. It, it, general historians mm -hmm. writing about the Normandy campaign, the Italy campaign. Do you think artillery is generally written about well or badly, or room for improvement? You know, perhaps compare it to writing about the infantry, about the armor. Is it something that historians? in your opinion, kind of do get a grip on or, or that or, or not so well? It's uh, it's because it's a, it's a technical arm and and, uh, and it's it is so, uh, I would say, omnipresent in, in Commonwealth doctrine. That's the way we fought. that I think it gets overlooked and, and it's it's not very it's not very sexy, you know, in terms of uh, maneuver and tanks and that sort of thing. It's uh, it's uh, but it's the way and it's the way we chose to, to fight because we were good at it. Uh, uh, so uh, it often doesn't get reflected in things like, uh, you know, video games. You don't get to call down 72 guns on the guy in front of you because that's what you could have done in, in, in the war. But it doesn't seem fair to, to do that. Well, we don't we don't fight fair. We fight to win. So uh, and, and the Commonwealth artillery was uh, was one of the things that, uh, that was that war battle winning war winning factor and very different from the way Americans uh, organized thing. That's another thing that rarely it comes out in, in books is that the fact that uh, U.S. doctrine was very different, uh, equally successful, uh, but, uh, but but a different way of doing things. No, I agree. I think it's so often in the books, you just, you hear, you hear whether it's, a, I'm re reading about American or German or British, they just say, and artillery was ordered and artillery opened up at and that's kind of the only explanation you get. There's no real sense of how it was organized and is the American system, as you say, they're different to the, to the Duke to system. And it's just, it's something they, they bring in there. But um, I'll check if there's George, any George, Black, George, Blackburn, George, George Blackburn's books, uh, on, yeah. you know, Guns of Victory, Guns of Normandy, Where the Hell are the Guns? Because uh, he's also telling the story of the battles, but he's also giving you a very good uh, look at how a foo works and how, what a foo does and how the artillery is organized. So, the, the, if you're looking for a, a, a veteran gunner, veteran's perspective on all that, those books are are, are excellent. Okay, so we had a, a few questions about twenty-five pounders, sextons, priests. Um, their 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 effectiveness. Was there a difference? You know, does the twenty is the twenty-five pounder better or worse than the priest? The, 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 the you know, have you got any kind of firm opinions on that, or is it too much into the top trumps? comparisons where you you can't really compare like for like i mean they were the, the, the americans because of the french you know adopted the 105 you know after the 75 millimeter gun that the 105 was the medium gun and the french army became the field gun in the, in the american army um and and the the british went for a, a, a development of the 18 pounder so they're both developing guns within their own stream and the uh, desire for a gun that was light enough to do the 360 degree traverse uh, d you know, d drove a smaller caliber. The, the 25 pounder caliber is about 88 millimeters, like 87 point something. Uh, it has a much higher rate of fire and a longer range, uh, by only about a thousand meters, but, but it has a longer range than a, than a 105. It has a smaller shell. The shell is 25 pounds. The, uh, the uh, 105 shell is about 35 pounds. So it has a larger explosive on the 105. So, but they're used essentially as the, for the same thing, uh, just in different uh, different armies. And after, of course, after the war, NATO standardizes on the 105, and, and everybody gets uh, 105s by the mid 50s. Okay, thanks for that. Um, and then Sean is asking about the um, you mentioned about the the, the um, forward observers taking to the air, uh, and you know it's about we. We should mention James Doohan, of course, you know, Scotty from Star Trek, because he, he went yeah. through the, the range of experiences kind of being on the ground initially and then um, screw this for a game of soldiers. I want to be in the air. And then that, <laughs> it was, wherever you are, it's always dangerous as a forward observer. And I think one of the things I think someone told me a few that, 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 that the forward observers are one of the highest casualty rates in the cemeteries here in Normandy, you know, that, that across the, the Duke forces because of the. The inherent dangers of being where they are and doing what they're doing but any particular sort of final details about 
the development of for, uh, foods as the as the war went on, or was rather as the Normandy campaign went on? Yeah, and of course, George Blackburn has that distinction of being the longest surviving foo of the Second World War. He was a foo all the way from Normandy to the Netherlands, um, and he had five uh, crews uh, worth worth of soldiers uh, as casualties around him. So he was a bit of a he was a bit of a, of a bad luck charm for the gunners who worked with him. But he uh, he was he was finally given a break in, in about uh, March or April of 1945. But, they, but you're right, is the, 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 the casualty rate of foos, if you look at you know, through artillery units, is, uh, is tremendous. But they're also using, you know, arrow peas are used mainly with the medium guns to look for, for counter battery, for, for looking at, uh, at, at enemy artillery, because it's very difficult uh, to, to determine where the front line is from the air, you know, where, uh, who's shooting at who. So you, it wasn't often used to control fire right at the front line. But it was used to find mortars, find uh, guns, find headquarters uh, behind the lines, and they would look out over the lines. And of course, there's a whole other system of target acquisition, of sound ranging, of flash spotting, and eventually radar uh, for mortars to uh, to find targets behind the lines. And so, and, and of course, air photos, the, the, the thousands and thousands of air photos that are taken and, and examined to find uh, targets behind uh, behind the lines that are then struck, but most of that is what's called predicted fire, which is by definition going to be less accurate than observed fire. You don't have someone looking at it, which is why you want to get that arrow P up there to, to, to spot the, the, uh, the rounds coming in. But he had to time his flight. He had to fly towards the line, hear the shot over the radio, climb up in the air, roll on his back, look at the target, and then dive back down without ever crossing the front line. Uh, and, and then send the adjustment. So uh, it's amazing a bit of flying that they were doing in these Austrians and uh, on the American side, the, the L-19 bird dogs, because they were they, they would rarely uh, cross over to the enemy side of the line because they're just so vulnerable to flying so low. Okay. Well, well, I think we'll leave it there because uh, you're you've got a holiday and things to get around to do, and I've got things to do. <laughs> it's been a go. brilliant, brilliant opener to the artillery week, and. Uh, and you've broken your duck, and you, we've all learned something. So uh, I hope our paths cross here in Normandy at some point in the future. Hopefully, um, that'll be good. And uh, and I love going to Point Sixty Seven. I think it's it's such an effective monument. It does it it, it has it memorializes those who were there. But as as you know, it, it also explains the battle. It's, there's nothing worse than going to a monument where it says, "Here's a unit," and it doesn't tell you what the thing was they did. You just go, <laughs> "Okay." I know this unit here. That one has maps. It has the, the, the orientation. It's it's a really cracking memorial, and not enough people go there. Yeah, Terry Cop was the one who said we have to put something there to tell our story, and eventually it all came to pass. But yeah, it's a, it's a great uh, a great spot. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, say hello. Say happy birthday to Sam for me. I will do. I'll be there in about ten minutes time. So, folks, I will see you all again tomorrow at the normal time. Uh, we're talking about Soviet tank destroyers, stroke assault guns. Stroke, um, whatever else they want to be, they call them tank hunters, tank destroyers, but it's all it's all tubes, it's all artillery, it's just uh, different versions of it. That'll be tomorrow with J.R. Tracy. But thanks for your company today, folks, and I will see you all tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Cheers.